so today uh, it's a bit different lecture so i will not be talking too much about uh, programming but more of the concepts of user interface in in a finite element application for uh, enhancing the process of design and engineering so this is a talk that uh, uh, some of the work is from Daniel Aukeson, which has been a uh, uh, PhD student at um, Structural Mechanics, and also a work by me. Um, so it will be a bit different. The second part will be, um, after the coffee break, will be about how to use Python and also a bit about high performance computing in general. Um, what options there are and how you can use them. So two bit different concepts. Uh, next week on Monday, there will be a guest lecture from the company Struesoft, uh, which will be talking about how they develop um, engineering applications. So let's go on here. So computational tools in architecture and engineering. So you probably already have used some of the tools that in your computer labs for uh, doing computation. Um, and there is a quite big difference between using tools in architecture uh, compared to, for example, engineering. In architecture, you have a very iterative process, very fast. And in engineering, you have a bit different approach to uh, your application. So uh, this is the classical simulation cycle when you are using finite element applications. You, you start by defining the geometry uh, and you apply your forces and boundary conditions on these uh, on, on that geometry. You define your materials. Uh, you run your simulation, which creates the mesh and solves the uh, equation system. And you evaluate results. And then you start all over again. And usually these steps are very discrete steps in, in the application. So. A typical example here is shown here using the um, application called Hawkon, which is a, an application developed at Structural Mechanics together with Scanscott uh, and Vattenfall, uh, which simulates the hardening, hardening of concrete. As you know, hardening of concrete is a process where um, when you cast uh, concrete, it, uh, it produces heat. And in large uh, structures, it's very important that you keep control of the heat in some way. Otherwise, uh, the structure will crack and uh, uh, it will not be an optimal uh, solution. So here is the first step is that you define the geometry. Here, you also implicitly uh, um, assign um, the element mesh because the element mesh is, uh, is a structured mesh and it's uh, um, defined by rows and columns here. So um, you, you can set them on the, on the, on the different lines here to uh, define the number of elements uh, in the structure. So next, we defined the materials. So we have a list of material here. You have the ground material. And we also have concrete material. Uh, assign those to the, uh, the geometry. Next, you uh, apply boundary conditions. In this case, we have an uh, outside temperature. It could be varying temperature on, on, the, on the size. Uh, we have, uh, and then when you're done here, you uh, execute your simulation. So here is, you have to wait. And if it's a large problem, it can be, take a, a very long time. And you have to wait all the time to, before you can look at the results. Um, so now you decide here, okay, this is not an optimal structure. I have to start again uh, from the beginning. And then you, you go back here to, okay, I changed my geometry here. And then I have to do my steps again, time stepping again, waiting for the results and investigating the results again. This is the classical way of doing a, uh, a finite element applications. Very discrete steps and uh, yeah. You kind of don't, don't remember what, what to change and how it affects the, you have to wait for the results to appear. So there are some problems here. So there's a lack of feedback between the modeling and the visualization and discrete computation steps that interferes with the design process. Uh, and it's also very difficult to employ, especially if the, if the simulation times are long, um, it can 
be difficult to kind of have a discussion on. I change this here and, and, and look, look, see what happens. So have, if you have to wait 20 minutes before every step, it could be a bit problematic. So it's very difficult to understand the behavior of the structure. So what is the solution? So what if we could remove the time stepping? So we, we put the simulation somewhere else. Then we can have something like this. So you have the application, you have the geometry on one side and you have the, the results on the other side. And then you change the, the geometry. And on the other side, the results appear automatically or directly. So this, this is, gives you instant feedback, but also gives you uh, a better understanding of, of, your, of your material, the phenomenon that you're studying. So for example, you can see here, if I change this point here, this will affect the structure in this way or the, the temperature in a certain way or the, the um, and also encourage you to explore things. So what if I change here, what happens in the structure or the stresses on the other side? So one problem here is that calculations can take a long time. So how do we, how do we kind of make this happen? So first a bit about, a bit about computer theory. So in many cases, uh, many codes and computational codes are designed around a single CPU processor. So you have one task per processor. Uh, it executes and, uh, from one point and it's done, it's done. So in this case, you, you always have to wait for the result to, to finish. So this is a single CPU processor. This is very, this is not very common today. So most of you that have, you have a laptop or a desktop, all, all computers today have multiple cores in, in, the, in the processor. So in this case here, you have uh, four CPU cores. And in this case, you can run four simultaneous tasks on this machine. So in this case, you can scale up your problem uh, and uh, it can finish faster, but you need to take advantage of this. So the classical modeling here is that you start modeling, you do your computation and do the visualization. These are kind of discrete steps after each other. So um, could we do something more with this? So suppose we do the computation simultaneously. So we have a task that is running in the background, for example, uh, for doing the computation. We can even add more tasks in the background for doing the computation. So we could um, have the, your, your simulation code stand by all the time. So if you change the parameter, there's always a calculation going on. Uh, even if the model is not stable, you can still try to see if you can run it, the simulation. So this could, um, uh, one way of doing it. And if you look at the technology trends today, uh, I mean, clock frequencies are not increasing very much anymore. I mean, we have several years now where computers are running at three gigahertz, four gigahertz, it hasn't changed. Uh, it's also so that we have see trends that we have lower clock frequencies to save energy. But what is happening is that many of your computers are having more and more cores. So it's not, uh, um, Many of our, our servers today, uh, the server processors have uh, 16, 32, even up to 64 cores per processor. Uh, and if you look at, for example, your graphics card in your, in your, when you're playing games, these graphics cards have up to three, 4,000 cores, if they're really, the really expensive ones. Those are small processors that can do parallel computation. So what you're seeing when you're playing a game is actually um, real parallel computing. So to produce that image with all the shadows and stuff, that is a parallel programming task that, that, that runs on your GPU. So if you can use this, you can have multiple teraflop performance, teraflop that is um, floating point operations per second on a, on a workstation hardware. And you can have 200 to 400 gigaflops per performance on a mobile hardware. So there's a lot of performance in your computer that we don't take advantage of. So, um, 
and actually many of the finite element simulations that that is done today can can actually be achieved almost in real time so and also if you if you uh, design your code in in a um, smart way you can take advantage of this multi-core to kind of when when you are waiting for or thinking yourself when you're awake uh, figuring out your problem you're probably not letting the computer do anything so during that time the computer can automatically do the computation so when you're kind of uh, having a coffee or you're thinking about how to solve a problem the computer goes around goes uh, throws out a task to kind of try to simulate your the, the current problem uh, to kind of continue to do the things in the background. Uh, and that enables you to keep, to create applications that can be directly manipulated uh, on the screen. So for example, when you move a node, the computation is automatically uh, done. And that gives you direct feedback on your, in, in your computation. So then you can also give the users uh, the, the way of exploring computational uh, models in, in, in different ways. So I will show you some examples here of tools that uh, uh, we have developed to kind of show you the possibilities of this. So uh, what we wanted to kind of see what was possible if we can use the popularity of touch and multi-touch devices such as iPad, iPhone, and Android to create interfaces where you can directly interact with the, um, the model using your fingers. So when you move a node on the screen, it does the computation and updates the model directly. And that also gives the user the impression of directly manipulating physical objects. So it's, it's very intuitive and direct. Uh, and most of the mouse-based uh, application can be adapted for touch. So to uh, update here, so you can have this, this kind of update the direct manipulation cycle here. So if you have your model geometry, the program automatically can just try to simulate and visualize the results directly. Uh, same thing when you add forces and boundary condition, it checks to see, is the model stable? Yes, then I save it or do the calculation. If it's unstable, you can actually visualize the mechanism of that unstable structure. Uh, and also if you change the material properties, it also changes and simulates in the background to kind of see the effects of this. So in this case, you, you get this kind of uh, simu doing uh, simulations all the time. And I'm going to try to do uh, an example here. I have a video here that is a part of the presentation, but I think I, I will do it live. It's always a bit dangerous, but I will try. So uh, we did a couple of years ago an application called ForcePad, uh, and ForcePad is, is a is a drawing application, but it's a bit different than many other drawing applications. So it uses uh, you paint with stiffness. So white is no material, and black is a completely stiff material. And then you can have different shades of gray here to simulate different stiffnesses. So in this case here, you are geometric shapes here. So a simple way of doing, for example, a beam is just drawing out a beam like this. Uh, the pro program has uh, multiple modes. So this is the uh, geometry mode. Here you kind of draw your geometry of your model. And then you have a, a physics mode where you can apply uh, boundary conditions here. So I put uh, constraints here. So these constraints that th those mean that you have a this one here means that it can the structure can move uh, horizontally, uh, and this one here means that it can move um, vertically. So if you put two of these here, you constrain uh, the structure in both x and y direction. So this structure here can move uh, here in in uh, in this direction, uh, and it's fixed here. But then I can apply a load. I put the load here in the middle here, like this. And then I, I go to uh, action mode. And here it simulates the, um, the structure directly. So this, what I've shown you now is basically just a normal uh, finite element application. But the interesting with this application is that you can actually uh, change the load here automatically. So if I, I, if I rotate the load here, it does the calculations automatically. 
And you can also see the reaction forces here changes depending on how I, I move the load. I can move the position of the load as well. So I can move it down around like this. I can also show the stresses here when I move it around. Uh, and I can also see the displacements here. And they, this gives the user the, the possibility to, to explore the structure. So what I can do then, I can go back to uh, my drawing board here and, and see what happens if I draw um, a white circle here. Or, uh, like this. And you see you have my, my constraints left here and I can go into the structure here. Go back here and now you see here that uh, uh, the structure updated and I can move my um, my load around and see how that affects the stresses in the structure. There's also another thing you can do with this program here is that you can uh, oh, wrong I have to move dark I fill it up here again. So this program has a, a special mode here where it can optimize the structure here. So if I have a load here and I want to create the optimal structure uh, for this structure, I can use the optimization tool here. And I click it and I select here, I want to use uh, maximum 40% of the material. And then I run it here. And you can see here that it creates a the optimal structure here, depending on my criteria here. I can also simulate, so if I go back here and I put the constraint here and do the calculation again and then optimization again, you get a quite different structure here. Okay, if I can solve it here. Um, so that is what you can do with this program. Uh, you can also, of course, go into um, it's possible to, to kind of draw in freehand like this. Uh, I can go back here. Uh, I can also uh, assign um, Um, it's, uh, sorry, um, eigenvict or a dead load as well. So I just tick that one and, uh, and it will, I don't have to put any forces on it. It will be uh, automatically calculated here as a dead weight here. So you can see also how it works. I can go back, I can add a load, a root dead load. So in this program, we do we uh, iteratively do the calculation over and over again, uh, and that enables you to do a lot of uh, interesting things. Now this is a static uh, linear calculation, but uh, and it also executes on a single thread. But it would be possible if you have a more powerful computer uh, to do this in parallel, to run it on multiple cores, and even have uh, uh, more complex material models than this. But even this simple program gives you a, a new way of seeing your structures and, and uh, interacting with them. Uh, I have a, another interesting example that I usually do is uh, it's very simple to, for example, if you want to compare two structures, you can do that like this. And I copy it uh, and just add it beneath here. And then I uh, for example, if you want to study different uh, boundary conditions here, how they affect, for example, deflection, I can put the same boundary conditions here and here. And I can put, for example, uh, like this. Uh, 
and I can calculate them in the same uh, image here and compare. Uh, so you, you can see that, of course, you have more stresses in, in the above structure than you have in the below because I have a, a, um, an additional um, support here. So this is a way of kind of comparing things. You can also see that deflections are uh, quite a bit different here if you compare them. So if you have a really long structure, you can see here, if you put the support here, you can decrease the deflection uh, very much. So that was force pad. Uh, so in direct directory models, uh, you can do direct modeling, uh, conceptual modeling. Um, you can have explorable user interfaces where you can try out different things. Um, and touch will add the direct interaction with your model. So basically, you, the, the finger points at the model. And you, if you move the finger, it will update uh, the model automatically. We did also uh, um, in a science center here very, a couple of years ago, uh, they had one of the first uh, touch sensitive whiteboards. This is very common in all schools today, but we try to develop a version for, for, for this board where you can use the entire whiteboard to, in, to interact with the models. Uh, so it can be used for teaching material uh, mechanics and you can also do it for larger groups so you can kind of lecture and, and show things on the whiteboard. So I, I call it a structural whiteboard. Uh, and uh, what we had to do is actually, uh, there were some interesting uh, aspects of this. Uh, because uh, you can't have normal menu entries here. You need to kind of adapt for the touch sensitive. And also, uh, if you had uh, users that were not so very uh, long, they, they didn't reach up on the high. So we need to kind of move the, the toolbox down so you can reach it. So there are some kind of interesting aspects of that. Having it on a, on a, on a table would be much better, actually. But we haven't tried that yet. Shown it before. Um, we also did uh, some experimentation in, in 3D. And I will try to show this application as well. Um, so this is an application called Objective Frame, uh, where you have a kind of a table here where you can work. Uh, and what you can do with this is a, it's a, it's a three-dimensional uh, frame application. So here you can put nodes out like this. Um, And then you can uh, draw beams between these here, like this. So this is a beam structure. I can probably add a stiffening here as well. Like that. And the idea with this application is that you can interact with the model uh, in real time. So what you can do here is you can add a kind of finger point here. So if I add a, I can, I can select one of the nodes here and ah. Now I have a problem here because I haven't uh, put any constraints on this. So we need to um, uh, lock the nodes here. So let's see here. Uh, 
So I want to select, uh, fix these points here. Uh, so now you can see here I have uh, some constraints on these. And now it should work better. So let's see if I can. So now you can see here that it calculates the, the deflections here in real time. And you can also view the results here for the uh, normal forces in the in the beams here. So this is compression and uh, red is tension. So you can do this on, on larger structures as well. So let's see if we can open one. program. Uh, sorry, objective frame. In... So here I have a bridge and I can use the same thing here. So here you can see that in more detail how, how it would work and how you can you can zoom in and look at the deflections here. And you can add the results here as well. Here you can see the kind of uh, bending moments of the structure. So that's an objective frame. And um, so you can also do really uh, large structures as well with this one. Okay. There is a uh, tools create structure. So let's see if I can fix these here. Uh, <clears throat> live demos is not a good thing here. Do it like this. that and then we zoom out no this is not an optimized version of this but just basically in real time and here you can see here if we add normal forces here you can see the this tension here and it's it's compressed here in the blue sections here So objective frame. Uh, we also did some experimentation with objective frame using a, a special tool called Leap Motion. It's a special sensor. So if we show here, 
Uh, here on the screen here, or on, on the table, there is a small sensor and it picks up your hands and it can translate those into digital hands. And in this case here, you can uh, use your hands to pick and move your structure around. So this is something also quite interesting to directly manipulate the structure using your, your, your hands, virtual hands. Um, yeah, we are working, trying to kind of simplify this user interface as well. So this, this objective frame is a test bed for uh, 3D applications uh, interaction with them. Uh, we also did a iPad application. Uh, we haven't updated in a time in, in some while now, but uh, it's done here. And it's, uh, we tried to simulate, see how, how far we could take the iPad to do finite element applications. So we created, um, the goal was to create an interactive conceptual tool that we can use both for education, communication, discussion, and also have as a kind of tabletop tool to discuss with, for example, uh, architects and, and customers that you do this time for. So, uh, example, an iPad is a thing that you can have on on, on your table, and in, and two people can interact with it, especially the, the larger ones. Um, so, let's see if we can do an application that can can do these things. Um, and, and we can interact with them. So uh, the goals were direct manipulation. That means that when you move something, it updates automatically. Uh, it should use a 2D frame trust analysis code. So that's a basic tool. Uh, one goal was to have no simulation button, no run button to in your in your code. So it should continue to simulate. So if you uh, if your structure isn't stable or there is not enough uh, boundary conditions. Uh, it will detect the mechanism and also visualize the, the, the mechanism. And by default, it creates hinged beams and you can add uh, constraints to make the, the, the connection points completely stiff as well. So, uh, and, and, uh, so you can stiffen them up if you want. Uh, a user can also add rotational constraints to the structure. So, we can go back to here, eliminate the discrete calculation step uh, and bridge the gap between modeling and visualization. Uh, use more and more in, in uh, modern computer architecture. And uh, yeah. so this, I think I have, a, didn't have, yeah. I have an example here of the, yeah, it's in the wrong order. Um, so this is the, an example of how to use uh, this sketcher frame. So. What we discovered is that the easiest way of drawing things is actually to just click and draw and it creates the nodes and, and beams automatically when you draw with the fingers. So you just um, click and, and drag out, it will create the nodes and, and the and beams between the nodes. And here we just drag between the nodes to create uh, more beams. And now we add constraints. And now we add a load. And you see, directly when we added a load, it, it calculates automatically. And you can drag the load with your finger and update the structure uh, interactively in real time. And the length of the load is also uh, the, the magnitude of the force. So you can change that. Same thing here, you see the compression is blue and tension is red. So now we are stiffening up the nodes. So making, uh, basically making it a frame instead of a, a, a truss. You can see that and now you get the moments as well of, of the structure uh, automatically. Yeah. 
And here you're scaling the, the forces here by just dragging in real time. So that was sketch a frame. So to conclude, um, there are a lot of things we can do with modern application to, to get, get more uh, iterative feedback when you're, just, when you're modeling. And also the direct manipulation simulation cycle is, is great for exploring and investigating models. Uh, combined with touch, that makes it a very powerful tool. Um, yeah, I think I said that. And future develop. So what we are working is kind of a, a real-time engine for finite element application. We kind of see how far we can take uh, finite element codes and, and make them more real-time. Uh, and also explore more touch-enabled devices. So ForcePad is available for free. Uh, you can download that. Uh, unfortunately, Objective Frame is not currently available to download. But Objective uh, ForcePad can you can be found uh, on the the, the Windows App Store, uh, and if you Google it, you can find a download for, for a Mac as well. So I, I think we'll take um, uh, we pause until five past uh, four, and then I will do uh, the high performance computing lecture as well. Okay, so now another change of topic. So um, as we are using Python and numerical computing, I want to give you kind of an insight in what the possibilities are of using high performance computing systems and, and what they are and how you can take advantage of them. I will also try to give a demo where I run the code that you develop in your uh, um, assignments uh, on a supercomputer and, and, uh, and what the benefits of using Python is. So, so first, a bit of outline. I will give you a short introduction, uh, short supercomputer history. Um, so, and also what the architectures are of these computers, how they are kind of put together and, and uh, how they conceptually work. And also Lunark, uh, so I'm working part-time or full-time as a uh, director of Lunark, which is the uh, Center for uh, Scientific and Technical Computing at Lund University. So we operate, uh, several uh, high-performance computing system or clusters uh, for the research at Lund University. Uh, so what is a supercomputer? Uh, so generally it's a, a term that kind of stands for the fastest cur computers currently available. And this is a kind of a definition I found on the web here. So computers typically used for crunching scientific simulations, geological data, structural analysis, computational fluid dynamics. Um, so, but, but this is kind of a, uh, it's a relative term. So it's very time dependent. I mean, 10 years ago, um, a laptop today would be, have been uh, almost a supercomputer. Um, so I usually use the terms, a computer that can offer more, much greater capacity than a desktop computer at the present. Uh, or have properties that a normal computer architecture can't offer. So performance, the first point is, is kind of, you need to perform, for example, a param, param, parameter study like you do in, uh, in this course, but you have like uh, 10, 10,000 uh, things you have to do. Uh, and if you do it on, on a single computer, it will take you months, for example. Uh, so, um, that's one task. Another task could be that you have a, um, you need a lot of memory. So you have a model that is extremely huge, big data. You want to load it into the computer and an, um, do analysis on it in, when you have it in memory. And many of, that is also kind of a supercomputer property, something that you can't do on your workstation or, or laptop. Uh, so why do we need supercomputers? I mean, one argument is that computers are always getting faster. You just have to wait 
a couple of months and then you can do your simulation. Uh, but that is, uh, but there are problems that you, that require large resources today. Um, for example, you can't wait for uh, yeah, uh, you can't wait for the weather to the simulation of weather. It can't the simulation for the weather can't to wait too long. Then it's not a forecast. Then it's kind of just a fact, a history, a historical fact. Uh, and in those cases, you need a supercomputer that can perform simulations that produce results that are kind of relevant. Uh, and also, if you have faster computer, for example, you can do more simulations. Uh, for example, if you if you are a car manufacturer and want want to do safety testing on cars, uh, if you have a large supercomputer, you can perform a lot of tests uh, of the car instead of uh, waiting for them to with a with a slow computer. So you can do more simulations as well. So meteorology is something that is uh, done uh, simulated regularly, and, and man many of the forecasts are done on the computers, uh, on, on uh, large computers to, uh, to forecast the weather. And in Sweden, we have a collaboration with Norway. So we, uh, they actually have a shared supercomputer. There's one computer in Linköping and one in, in Oslo, I think. Uh, and they are synchronized and, and they, um, uh, the simulations are connected together, so the boundary conditions are, are uh, exchanged. But they're also designed so they can take over for each other uh, in case of some, some things, something breaks. But these are large computers. There are like 500 servers connected together to, to do the simulation. They're extremely uh, intensive. And, and, and the idea is that uh, you want to simulate uh, entire countries divided up in small grids. And you want those grids to be small enough to kind of uh, give, give you accurate weather in, in uh, in, in high enough detail, and the more the more grid points you have, the more computer the the, the, the longer the kind of computation takes, and then you need a supercomputer. Crash simulation is also a very common thing that you use uh, large computers for. Uh, fluid simulations uh, that is also something that is extremely um, requires a lot of com computational power. Especially if you want to resolve it in, in, in very uh, high detail, for example, to be able to simulate turbulence and stuff, that, that, that is extremely computational demanding. And then you need supercomputers to do that. Uh, and, and many manufacturers, uh, I think Saab, and, uh, they do uh, virtual wind tunnels where they test their, their, their aircraft before they fly the, uh, the aircrafts. So they put them in, 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 a, in a virtual wind tunnel to, to do those tests. And then you save a lot of uh, uh, practical test. You can do a lot of simulation before you do one uh, practical experiment. Uh, we also do a lot of, we have also a lot of uh, people from medicine doing a lot of simulations, uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, DNA simulations or uh, bioinformatics, uh, delving into the genomes and seeing the differences and patterns in those. Uh, so that's also um, something that has grown. Um, problem, of course, that doing this in humans requires you to have systems that are can handle sensitive data. So you need to make, make sure that the data can't leave the systems. So there's a lot of safeguards around the systems that we provide for th that kind of simulation. So we, we for example, we have a, a system for simulating bioinformatics uh, together with regular Scalona. Um, there's a lot of securities around that, and it's, it's, it's placed in our computer room, but it's connected to uh, uh, their networks also, and it's, it's, um, there's locks and bars with, on the rack, so um, an authorized person can't access them. Structural mechanics, of course, uh, we need to resolve a smaller um, structures in smaller details and, and simulate phenomena like uh, advanced material models. All of that also requires a lot of uh, computational power. You, often you can't do that on a single computer. Uh, theoretical chemistry, um, drug modeling, for example, um, requires a lot of computational power. And uh, the nice thing with chemistry is that basically their models can scale up to a large supercomputer without any problem. So the more computers you have, the faster the simulation goes. There is no kind of uh, slowdown there. So let's go back in time a bit and just kind of compare uh, the performance of computers going from 
early beginnings in the 60s up to until now. So this is kind of what computers looked like in, in the 60s. Uh, large rooms uh, and uh, uh, tape archives, uh, a first kind of a initial terminal with the cathode ray tubes. And this machine is measured in, our machine performance is measured in something called floating point operations per second. So they, this is actually how many floating points that we can do per second. And this machine here, uh, the CDC 6600, did 9 million floating point operations per second. And if we, I think this is wrong here, I think uh, a, a modern laptop or PC today could do, I think, 6 to 12 gigaflops per second CPU performance. Now we have GPUs as well, so you can go up in, in the hundreds of gigaflops uh, on a PC as well. Um, so in 64, we had nine megaflops to play with. In 1969, uh, Cray uh, created the 7600. We were up in 40 megaflops per second. Uh, in 76, uh, we had 160 megaflops. And uh, Cray is the, one of the companies that has been uh, one of the larger supercomputer manufacturers in the world. And, uh, in, and actually, this machine here, uh, Cray 1, was we had one in Sweden at the time, and it was used in the development of the, of the JAWS planes uh, to simulate some of the airframe structures. And it was very guarded by the Americans because Sweden was kind of not considered reliable. So there were a lot of security precautions around this machine uh, at Sol. In 1983, we have the Cray XMP, 235 megaflops per second. So we are not even close to a modern PC. Um, uh, in 1986, we have the IBM 3090, and this was actually one of the first computers we had at Lund University for supercomputing needs. So uh, 110 megaflops, and, and the VPF stands for Vector Processing Facility. And this was one, one of the models of computation that we developed at the time. So this was, a, uh, it was extremely fast of handling vectors of data. So it's of your NumPy arrays. It could handle a single vector of uh, several hundreds of floating points at the same time. So you had a single processor, but it could uh, but it could process vectors in parallel. So there were instructions for handling vectors in parallel. Uh, 99, we have a Cray YMP, and now we are starting to close into our modern PC. So now we have 2,144 megaflops, so 2.1 gigaflops. Uh, and now in 1993, we had a Cray T3D, which is 13.7 gigaflops. Uh, I think we had one of those in Linköping in Sweden as well at the uh, uh, National Supercomputing Center. Uh, in nine, somewhere around this period, 95, 97, something started to happen uh, regarding how, how uh, supercomputers were designed. So, uh, in 97, an American de um, developer supercomputer called ASCII Red. Uh, an interesting thing here that this was built on commodity hardware, so it, it was not a specially designed supercomputer. This was uh, basically uh, PCs connected together uh, in a cluster. So it was a commodity machine. 2.38 teraflops. Uh, and another huge machine was assigned in 2002 was um, in Japan, uh, it was called Earth Simulator, and it was designed to simulate uh, weather behaviors uh, because they have a lot of tsunamis in, in Japan and they want to make sure that they have control of this. So this is actually um, a viewing chamber here. You can see how large this machine is. It's 35.6 teraflops. Uh, 2004 Red Storm, 41.5 teraflops. Um, this is a quite interesting machine. This is usually what happens in, in the US that they have um, supercomputers designed both for civilian and military use. So the black end here was for military use and, and the white here was mixed use. And then the, there was a red part was uh, for um, dedicated for only civilian. And you can partition this in, in different ways and it, it will physically separate to make sure that, that uh, there was no communication between the military side and the civilian side. 
In 2005 and 2007, uh, IBM <coughs> designed a new computer, a supercomputer architecture called Blue Gene. And it was designed with uh, smaller processors, um, more energy efficient, but more of them. And, and this machine produced from 135 to 596 teraflops. Uh, so we are closing to the petaflop range now, which we are in today. Uh, 2012, uh, Lunark installed Alaric, which was 30 teraflops. So we haven't been, uh, we are a bit, bit behind we, in, in the performance scale here. It's also a question how much money you can spend on these machines. Uh, so these are uh, special cooling racks here between. So there is uh, water going into this rack, so they are cooled. These two racks are cooled by the air is going between them and blown. The, Cold air is, is uh, blown into the uh, front of the machines and hot air is sucked in on the backside. And then there is a, a cooling unit here in between. Uh, in 2008, Cray uh, is back again and they implement the created machine called Jaguar and it's 1.64 petaflops. And you can see here that you need a kind of a football field of racks. Uh, and there is also a dedicated cooling system here to handle the heat. So many of these machines produce uh, megawatts range of, of, of uh, energy. So its uh, computation is actually very uh, energy costly. So it's very important that you can reuse the heat in some way. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of not so very environmentally friendly. Um, IBM is back again in 2009 with Roadrunner. It's now we are 1.7 uh, petaflops. 2016, we designed Aurora at Lunark with 240 teraflops. And uh, we are not a football field in size. So you can see that the development is going down. You, you can have a lot more performances in a, a lot less space. We also did a custom lighting installation here just to kind of make it cooler when you show it. Um, 2018, 19, uh, Stampede 2 uh, in Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, 19 petaflops. So you can see how, how much performance we have now in our computers. It's it's quite staggering in, in, um, in what you can simulate today. Uh, so how, how are these computers designed? So there are, are several architectures that you can use to, do, to define uh, paracomputing architectures. Uh, the normal computer that is a single core is something called single instruction, single data. This is von Neumann machine. Uh, so that is not a parallel computer, but this is a normal computer. Then you have the SIMD machines that is single instruction, multiple data. That is what the machine I showed you, vector processing facility. Uh, that machine can handle uh, vector instructions, so handle multiple vectors uh, in parallel. Uh, then we have multiple instruction, multiple data. That's kind of a mix of things. Uh, there are two main ones that are multiprocess and multi-computers. So multiprocess, those are computers where you have um, multiple processes inside the same computer and, and they share memory together. So many of laptops or PCs today have multiple cores. And that is a small multiprocessor machine. It has in that process where you have multiple smaller CPUs that share memory. But you can do that on a larger scale. So for example, most of our um, servers today in, in Lunark have two processors and each processor have 10 cores. So in total, you have uh, 20 uh, uh, cores in each server that can do computation. And then there are several uh, ways that you can um, connect the memory together here. So you can have unified memory architecture, basically that all memory is available to all processors without any uh, delays. Then you have non-uniform memory architecture where uh, the memory closest to the process is, is the fastest, and then you have uh, the process, the memory on a nano processor a bit slower to access. It's called a, a non-uniform memory architecture. Then we have something called multi-computers. So this is a high-level design where you connect uh, fully fledged computers together in a network. And they communicate together using uh, messages. Uh, and then you can connect the computers in different ways uh, in grids. And these machines here are called shared memory, and these are called message passing architectures. 
So if you compare those in a shared memory machine, you have uh, processors that are connected to a single shared memory. Uh, and that, that, that is usually one operating system um, sharing a memory and you can run one single program and it will, you, you have to divide it up over the processors. Um, the other option is, is using message pass, passing and then, then you have one computer is here, you have a processor with its own memory and it's connected to a network. So if I want to do parallel computing and then I want to share my task, this processor have to send messages to other processors here to uh, communicate data between here. And usually you have a, in modern supercomputers, you have a combination of these here. So you have uh, servers connected together in a message passing in, interconnect network. Each server has a shared memory architecture. So it's a kind of a hybrid today with, with uh, multi-core computers and message passing to communicate between the, the processors. Uh, you can connect them together in different ways. So here, the network can be star-shaped. You can have a multiple network. We have multiple connections to multiple machines. You can have a tree-like structure, grid-like structure, hypercute structures. The idea is that you want to minimize the, the number of hops between each computer in a, in a supercomputer. So uh, you have multiple paths to uh, the different computers in a network. Uh, so you can communicate faster. Performance. So uh, the idea with uh, with clusters um, is that when you add processors, you you ideally want your application to scale linearly. Um, so in this case here, so if you have ten uh, processors, you get ten in speed up. So this is the optimal solution here. This dotted line here. So if you have an application that scales like this, you probably will win some prizes because this is very high, very hard to achieve because uh, if you have a cluster, uh, there is a lot of um, overhead in communicating between the different uh, CPUs. Um, so this overhead can look like, so usually the curve is kind of bent down like this. So this is a very good application here. It scales quite nicely uh, um, up to 60 processors. Then we have another application here that has a slightly different speed up here. So the more processes you add, the more the, sl the, the slower the speed up becomes. So it's not very optimal. And if you have an application that looks like the bottom curve here, then there is no use to adding more processors. So perhaps up to 10 and then it starts kind of to teeter off here. Um, so this is where you measure your, your application performance. And, and the reasons for this is that for some application, the communication to solve the problem increases every time you add a new processor. You have to communicate more and more information between the processors. And at some point, um, the network chokes. There is no, no more bandwidth in the network. And that, that is what we see here that you can't communicate. There is no benefit of adding more processors because the, the network is kind of um, congested. Uh, the network, there is um, many factors for network communication. Um, so network is usually many, measured in bandwidth. So I mean, how much data you can transfer uh, per second over the network. Uh, that is, of course, one important factor, but it's not everything. There's also something called latency, and that is how long it takes for, to initiate communication. And uh, for example, normal network communications using Ethernet has a high latency. And, and that is something, if you have a lot of communication, for example, with small packages going through to and from computers, uh, that will actually uh, hinder the performance. Uh, and also depending on application. For example, if you want to render a movie, uh, it can be beneficial that can be do, done quite independently for each other. You can render the first 100 frames and the last, uh, and you can divide up the movie's frames in, into chunks that can be done individually on each uh, server. And then there's not a lot of communication. That is something that is uh, natively, uh, uh, naively uh, scalable. So you don't have to think about the network in this case. You just have to add more computers and it will go faster. Um, there are some different networks. So um, today we have uh, gigabit Ethernet. That's common. You have that at home. 
Um, in our server home, we have 10, 40, and 100 gigabit Ethernet connections. Um, we also have something called InfiniBand, which is a different standard that has um, very low latency. And uh, uh, also, there is a lot of hardware support for communicating without in, um, involving the processors. Uh, as I said before, there was a breakpoint here at some point where uh, we started to build in clusters uh, with normal uh, PCs and uh, PC hardware. Uh, before the 90s, all, almost all supercomputers were the classical uh, brands of uh, big uh, customized designs with their own processors, really expensive. Uh, and it required a lot of resources. For example, a Cray usually came with a support technicians to just maintain that machine and make it sure it ran. Uh, if you look at pieces today, they're extremely cheap per unit. Uh, they are mass market, low cost, uh, fast development, uh, especially with GPUs. So there is a kind of um, because of the mass, ma mar mass market, the prices of, of high performance components goes really down. Uh, except for uh, this year where we have uh, <laughs> shortages of, of uh, chips, especially with GPUs, for example. So in 1993, uh, there was a prof professor, um, professors that Donald Becker and Thomas Starling, they thought, couldn't we build um, supercomputing using PCs instead? And, and uh, what made that possible was actually the Linux revolution. So. Uh, that Linux Torvalds released Linux enabled people to actually build supercomputers really cheap without paying for any licenses. Uh, another important part was the compilers that you can compile your code um, and use the same uh, programming model as for the larger clusters using Linux. So this, there were standards for panel programming called MPI and PVM that actually enabled us to do this. Uh, and today, most system supercomputers today are built around standard server hardware uh, with InfiniBand connected together. So it's the ideas that came from this project was actually uh, what we have today mostly. Uh, even, even Cray builds some on standard hardware, but with a special network uh, after that. Uh, I will skip that. Uh, there's, there is a special chart here called top 500 that lists the, the different kind of architectures over time. So if you look here, we have um, the orange here is uh, the single processor supercomputers. And you can see there was a time at 1995 here where this was a, a important architecture. Uh, the green shared memory machine was popular until the 2000s here. Uh, and MPP is a special version of that here. It was also important here. But the blue part here is interesting here. So at some point here around uh, 2000 here, uh, the clusters uh, began to grow. So you can see here that, that, that this is the normal Linux clusters. And that is kind of almost 90% of, of the market today. Uh, Operating systems is quite interesting to see as well. Uh, blue here is Unix. So up until, uh, let's see here, around 2000 or something, uh, Unix-based operating system, the proprietary systems was, was the mo most popular. And today you can see that Linux is the 100% yeah, of everything uh, in supercomputing. So even, even Cray runs Linux uh, as the base operating system for the supercomputers. Uh, cores per socket, um, you can see here in the, here you had one socket and you had two sockets and green is six sockets and so on. So it's developed that we have more and more, more sockets uh, and, and what's most popular, 20, 60 cores, uh, 16 cores. Um, Co-processors, uh, accelerators, that is GPUs. Most common ones is the, let's see here, uh, NVIDIA, for example. So that NVIDIA has grown a lot. Um, so this, this is the without GPUs. 
without GPU accelerators. And you can see here that it's growing fast here, uh, accelerators being more and more common in, in supercomputers. Uh, in, interconnects here, InfiniBand here, this is the one of the major ones, and you have Gigabit Ethernet, uh, orange one here. And custom interconnect here, this is usually Cray. They have uh, their own custom interface between the, the servers. And here you can also see the, the performance development over the years here. So you can see here that uh, the, the triangles here are the number one computers over time in the top 500 list. So you can see we are, we are I think we are over, over 100 petaflops today. And what we are working towards is, is kind of the exaflop machines. And, and they are coming in, in just a couple of years. They're, it's not far away. Uh, and if you, the, the green ones here is the sum of all the performance here over time. So um, you can see here that actually you can see there is a hint of a line here. So there is a slowdown of performance in the sum here. And here you can also, the blue ones are the number 500 at, uh, at uh, the uh, top 500 list. Uh, yes. Uh, shortly, I want to just go through basically what, what, what is this, how, how you use this cluster. So usually these clusters you log in using a terminal or a desktop front end. So, um, and when you log in, you, you have a, a login node where you have all the software and the compilers. You have Python, uh, you have shared file systems uh, that are shared on the nodes. And you upload your files to this machine. And then you define a job, basically a script, uh, that defines the, the tasks that you want to perform, or multiple tasks, and you send it into a queuing system that kind of uh, looks for available resources, and when it's available, execute that script on, on a node. Uh, so what is a queuing system? So you have um, a queue here with jobs. You can have jobs that have a single node and a certain runtime here, and a, a shorter job here, and you have a, a dual core job here. Uh, and you have a scheduler. And the scheduler is responsible for kind of allocating the jobs in the queue. So here you can see it allocated this red job here to uh, these two nodes. And then it allocated once after here. So it kind of uh, maintains the schedule uh, for the jobs. And it does this iteratively all the time. So if a job terminates, it reschedules and, and uh, submits or starts other jobs depending on, on available resources. Um, trends in hardware, I think we already talked about that. More cores per processor. So the clock frequency doesn't decrease, but you get more uh, compute performance per processor. Uh, it's hard to use efficiently. You have to make, think about how, how to kind of um, use this course. If you're using Anaconda, for example, uh, many of the NumPy arrays can handle actually multiple cores. So if you have a machine of four cores, uh, matrix computation is done on multiple cores if you have large enough uh, uh, processors. General purpose GPUs or GPGPU is using graphical um, graphics cards to do normal computation. And if you can program them, you can get a really high speed up. But it's really hard to get, get really good performance on this because it's a very small processor, uh, smaller memory, and you have to make them interact without overhead. So it's a bit of a challenge to program them. But if you can, they will give you a lot of performance. This is a typical um, server on our, our clusters. So this is a... Um, special uh, blade chassis here. So this is one server. So there are 16 servers in this in total. So I have 16 servers. Uh, each server has uh, two processors. Um, I think we have 20 cores. So it's a bit more now, actually. This is an old. But 384 CPUs in a single chassis here, uh, like this. Uh, this is also something is we have a lot in a computer room. They, these are Tesla computers, so these, they have, these are graphics cards uh, uh, in a rack uh, for computing. We also have a graphics workstation built into the computer, so you can actually access 
do graphics on our computers. And let's just skip here. Um, this is what we have today at Lunar. So we have 24 servers for uh, visualization, and we have 300 servers in total for Aurora, which is our big production system. So that is over 6,000 processor cores uh, running at 2.6 gigahertz. Uh, and there is three gigabyte memory per core. So we have something with 64 gigabyte to 128 gigabytes memory per core, uh, per server. Uh, this is how we started off with the clusters at Lunar. So this is our basically normal desktop machines connected together in a network. Uh, so it was very cheap to do this compared to buying conventional supercomputers. And they're connected together not using normal Ethernet connections. And the single switch here, normal computers, switching. Uh, the next iteration here, we had uh, we bought smaller form factor computers uh, to make room for more. Uh, normal workstations from Dell. And you can see here, we connect them together in a single switch uh, using Linux. Then we became a bit more professional. So we bought rack servers that we connected together um, like this. Uh, looks a bit nicer than that, than uh, buying them on shelves. And this was the, another computer with 200 servers, uh, single core processors, uh, AMD 64 bit. Uh, this this was a IBM machine with blade chassis, thousand cores. What at the at the most? So this was 2007. We had uh, the time machine had thousand cores. A lot of cabling. Uh, here we also needed to use cooling, so we cooled the machines uh, at the back, and we had cooling doors like this. Uh, this is our grid machine for the CERN uh, sim uh, simulations in CERN. And this is, these are the, the blade chassis. Platon, 20 teraflops. We had Alaric I showed before, Aurora. And this is our rate page if you want to know more. So um, if you want to do something with uh, uh, Lunar or doing um, simulations, we, we will usually help out in, uh, in the Moth Diseases work and you can get access to our machines. Uh, just to finish up, I want to show you how it can look to use a supercomputer here. So this is the a desktop running on, on our uh, supercomputing Aurora. So I'm running Spider here, which is the, the tool that you have. I have Python here. And I can open a terminal here. Uh, and just to show you, so this looks like a normal desktop here, but if you look, let's type a command here, you can see what is running on the machine. So we have here, these are nodes. We have uh, something like 300 nodes, and you can see all the nodes that are running. And you can see the queue here. You can see all the, all the persons, the researchers doing simulations here. So R stands for running. And then you have uh, the number of days here. So this is a simulation running over six days. Uh, so there's a lot of going on here. And we, we produce something like 200 kilowatts of power uh, to operate this machine. But the nice thing with Python what I want to show you is that you can run your, your code that you developed. Uh, you can run on this system. So this is a, a ground flow, water flow simulation. Uh, it runs on Linux without any problem. And you can see here that it works on a, on a supercomputer as well. And if you want to adapt this program, you can you, you could change the parameter starter here to run over multiple cores on the supercomputer backend. So you can do thousands of simulations instead of uh, waiting for them simultaneously. So just to illustrate that it works like this. So this is the remote desktop environment we provide our researchers for using our, our supercomputers. So that was 